you will, open your Bibles to the New Testament and to the 1 Corinthian epistle. I want to start with verse 18. Paul writing to the church at Corinth says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Now let's get down to verse 25. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For those who will not receive the Word of God, because it's given by revelation of God through the Holy Spirit. The gospel message is foolishness. What is the gospel message? Well, we know from Romans 1.16 that the gospel is God's power to save man. The word gospel actually means glad tidings, good news, and for sinful man, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. And the wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23. Thus sin is the only thing that can separate us from God. Man had a sin problem. The greatest problem he's ever had, he still does. But God has solved the sin problem. Now listen to what Paul said as he was writing to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Remember what we've said about the gospel to those that will not receive revelation, the word that has been revealed by God to us, all scriptures given by inspiration of God. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you. So they've already heard it, haven't they? He's reminding them of it. They couldn't be Christians without believing and obeying it. Which also ye have received, there it is, that they obeyed it, yes, and wherein ye stand. By which, that is the gospel, also you are saved. But it's contingent upon this. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you believed in vain, that is, it was pointless to what you to your life as far as saving you in spiritual matters. For I delivered unto you first of all that which also I received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that He was seen of above five hundred brethren at once of whom the greater part remained of this present time he was writing that letter, but some have fallen asleep, some have died. So the unbeliever thinks what God has done in the way he's chosen to save man from his sins, the greatest enemy man has, because it separates him from God. He thinks that's foolishness. So unbelievers reason when you read in Matthew chapter 27 and verse 42. But for those who believe the word of the cross, then it's God's power to save. So you have those who receive revelation because it's been proven to be from God by the miracle signs and wonders that prove it to be from God. And you have those who won't receive revelation because they don't believe in it. They don't believe in God. They don't believe in Christ. They don't believe in anything outside of what their five senses can deal with in the present, in physical things, material things. Then to them, it's foolishness. Even the message is what's being brought out here. The very message of what I just read to you in 1 Corinthians 15 is foolishness. Well, look around you. Look at the people. I remember long years ago when I was a freshman in college, I was over in a high school friend of mine's room visiting. We were good friends. And I had my Bible, so I was sitting on his 
bed reading it and this kid from down the hall, I didn't know him, came in and he saw me reading it. And he said, you still believe that stuff? But I looked at him, I sure do. I see no reason not to. And uh, notice I said reason not to. He didn't have really anything to say beyond that. For some reason, his mind, the Bible was outdated. I don't know what all he meant because he wouldn't express himself. But he, he was amazed that I read it, that I believed it. Well, today, <laughs> over 50 years later, there's far more of that kind of thing going on than there was then. But the gospel is God's power to save. No, it's not. Yes, it is. Now, if we want to engage in a good study, show you why we know the Bible's from God and not from man, why it's addressed to man, for the good of man, and how that the gospel of Christ, as we read of it here, God's power to save, is truly God's power to save, then it ceases to be foolishness. But to those who will not receive revelation, who are wedded in the physical, then it's always going to remain foolishness unto them. But remember this, long before these words were written, and they were written almost 2,000 years ago, Isaiah the great prophet said, My thoughts are not your thoughts. Speaking for God, my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts, Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9. The simple answer to the why of that is he is God. The one eternal divine essence who is without beginning or ending and who created all things. And we dare not think of him as a mere human being. He doesn't move like we do in the sense of view things, understand things. He is God. When we speak of him as being omniscient, that means he knows all that is the object of knowledge. Nothing is outside of him in the way of knowledge. And so on with the attributes that characterize God. It has ever been a terrible mistake of man to set in judgment upon God by our human standards, by our finite human wisdom. And from just the human perspective, just only the human perspective, in our finite limited place we are now, many things of God have appeared to be foolish. But that's only because we try to judge God by our wisdom, our finite minds, and we won't receive the word that came by revelation and could not be had except God revealed it. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Now let's look at some of these things for a little while. And it's simple. Noah built an ark. A great flood like the world's never seen and never will see again was coming. The first mention of rain is in Genesis 2, chapter 2, verses 5 and 6. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was not a man to till the ground. Well, then how was the earth watered? But there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. If you look at all of that part of Genesis, all the way up through chapter 7, 1 through 7, you see the world the way it was before that great worldwide flood changed its whole setup and things work as they do now. Don't know that we can vision that in our minds just from the, what the Word of God says before the flood, but it was different. 
best we can get out of it is that there was no rain. It was sort of a hothouse effect without it being a hothouse. There was this moisture that was sort of like a foggy morning or something like that. And I'm not saying it was foggy all the time, but I'm trying to grasp what was then from what I got to deal with now that I observe and what it said about things then. Point is, it never rained like we know rain. And what was about to come would be the only time that kind of thing ever happened because it was far more than just a big deluge like we've seen here in Houston from hurricanes. When you get over into Genesis 6, 14 through 17, Noah, having found grace in God's sight, because he was a righteous man in the midst of all this meanness, God just simply said, make thee an ark of gopher wood. Then he went ahead and said, behold, I do bring a flood of waters upon the earth. I don't know what went on in Noah's mind when he heard that. But I do know he had never seen rain come as it does on earth today. The promise of God was that Noah and his house, wife, three sons and their wives, would be saved in the ark. That all those out of the ark would be lost. They would drown. I think you can say here is a good example from the Old Testament of the foolishness of God from the perspective of man viewing things from man's limitations. There's no record of rain on the earth before this, but Noah's told to build a huge boat to save his family and the animals of God that God, of course, told him to take into that ark. Read the 11th chapter of Hebrews same Holy Spirit that inspired Moses to record the events pertaining to the flood also inspired the writer of Hebrews to say by faith, well remember faith comes by hearing the word of God. That is Noah believed God's word. By faith Noah warned of God of things not seen as yet. Now think about that for a minute. Of things not seen as yet. Of things never observed through the five senses, never experienced by man in the flesh. Didn't bother Noah. He trusted God. He had a living, active, obedient faith because it says, yet not seen as yet, moved with godly fear. You know, the Bible says, hold you to your man's the fear of God and keep his commandments. And he moved with godly fear. Proper respect for God and what it means to be God. And he, knowing that a dead faith can't save him, prepared an ark to the saving of his house. Verse 22 of Genesis 6 says, Thus did Noah according to all that God commanded him, so did he. He did just exactly as God told him in his part in his salvation. But he'd never seen the flood. Can, can you imagine the f fun, we'll put fun in quotes, of the people in Noah's day? I imagine there was some derision in some way of the people toward Noah and how they may have laughed at him and mocked him. But Peter, by inspiration, tells us in the New Testament in 2 Peter 2 and verse 5 concerning Noah, simple words, Noah a preacher of righteousness. And thus we know why he built the ark and we know what a saving faith is and we know how grace through a saving faith saved someone way back over in Genesis. And Paul said in Romans 15, 4, whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. But I don't know what it would have been like for the people who would not receive the revelation of God as to things they had never experienced. And it was coming. Destruction. We'll think about it today. The Bible's clear. First of all, God said back in those days, after the flood, I won't destroy the world anymore by water. But when you read in the New Testament, 
the end of this world, the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth also, and the works of their end shall be burned up. Peter used that to say, now, that being the case of this present order of things in this material creation, what kind of people ought you to be in all your living, your holy living? He used it to exhort Christians to remain faithful no matter what. Well, I cannot vision in my mind what it's like when all of the cosmos crashes together and burns and melts and it's no more, nothing of time existing. There's no more time. There's no more matter. There's nothing like that of this present system of things. There's no more physics. There's no more biology. There's no more chemistry. There's no more anything. Remember at one time there was nothing and God by the power of his word said let there be light and everything else was brought into creation by his will manifest through his word. But people today think that the words of God are foolishness concerning the end of the world. And thus you've got the young man over 50 years ago saying to me, you still read that and believe it? Well, I was 50 some odd years ago and I still read it and believe it. In fact, I read it and believe it stronger now than I ever did. But let's go on further in the Old Testament. Another foolish thing from man's finite viewpoint who will not receive revelation from God. While Israel was journeying in the wilderness, you'll remember that they very often complained and murmured. And these were not just grunting because their bones were aching and their feet hurt from walking. It was speaking against God's chosen Moses and speaking against God for putting them out there. That's the kind of murmuring it was. And God chastened them. He punished them to bring them to repentance. And the occasion I choose is one of those I'm sure a lot of people call foolishness and still do to this day. In Numbers 21, verses 4 through 11, Numbers 21, verses 4 through 11, as punishment to their murmuring, the scripture says that he caused fiery serpents to come among the people and bit the people. And many people of Israel died. They didn't have any cure for that snake bite and the poison it put into them. Well, what are they going to do? Well, they cry to God. That seems to be typical. While if things are going well, we reject God. We pay no attention to Him. We do as we plead. We murmur and we complain. But then when things go bad and not a human can help us, we look somewhere else. Here's what God told Moses about that. Make thee a fiery serpent and set it upon a pole and it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten when he looketh upon it shall live. Now think about that for a minute. I've never met anyone who can explain the municipal properties of a brazen serpent that just by looking at it would cure me from poison of a snake bite that's killing everybody around me. So how can looking upon a serpent of brass cure snake bite? Well, I would recommend it today because this was a one-time event for their given situation. But I tell you, even today, looking back on that, people say foolishness. Well, if God's left out of it, it is foolishness. You leave God out of anything, it's foolishness. But what did Paul say about the gospel? The foolishness of God is wiser than men. You see, all of these are such that says, you won't do this except that you totally and completely love God and trust Him. There's no other reason to do it. You have no other place to go. So those are positive commands that are right for one reason and one reason only. God said so. And that's what really tests our faith in God and His Word. Everyone that was cured of snake by the camp of Israel had to be cured in God's way. There was just one way. God didn't say here's several ways. There was one way. 
I don't know, there may have been something because you're talking about people that covered an area as big as Harris County as they traveled at this time. You're talking about a huge amount of people. They had to make their way to where they could see that thing. Their own eyes could look at it like I'm looking at that clock back there. You're looking at this one. Now, that took some effort on their part, didn't it? It took faith to be able to travel to see that brazen serpent because they had to look at it to be saved from the snake bite. Well, I can just see somebody saying, why, well, it's enough just to sit here. Why have I got to, I'm sick and break, take all my sick people and put them on a donkey or drag them behind a camel and not able to walk and get travel all through all of this? Look at all these people, these throngs, and who wants to get in Houston rush hour traffic? Of course, they do all the time to go see football and baseball. They don't mind it at all. But they had to. There's just one way. Somebody can say, well, aren't there a lot of ways? I believe God can save me any way he wants to. He's God. Well, he can do that, but he chose this way, and that's the way he chose, and that's the way he revealed, and that's the only way that's going to work. It reminds you of Jesus in John 14, 6, where he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto me or unto the Father but by me. Well, now think about that same principle when it comes to the brazen serpent and children of Israel being cured for the snake bites. All the rest died if they didn't do what God said. Jesus referred to this event in connection with the foolishness of the cross and its place in our salvation from sin in John chapter 3, verses 14 through 15. Listen. Listen. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Now I know that this is going to be a shadow of something to come. Even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That whosoever believeth may in him have eternal life. See that just didn't happen back there for the sake of Israel and to cure their snake back. God was looking thousands of years ahead at Calvary. And what is time to God. But let's go to another one in the Old Testament. Written before time for our learning. That we can better appreciate the truth of God in the New Testament. And that God means what he says and says what he means. Naaman and a very important man in Syria. Had an incurable disease. The Bible says it was leprosy. 2 Kings 5 verses 1 through 15. Now, his wife had a little maiden, a captive girl of Israel. She saw the situation he was in, and she told of one in Israel who could cure leprosy. Let me deviate just a moment here. One little girl who's not even at home, who's a captive, really a little slave girl, and a maid. And yet look what she introduces. Brethren, the power of one person is always amazing to me. Thus, I want to say this in exhortation to every one of us, wherever you are, whatever you're doing. First of all, do it by the authority of the Lord as set out in the words of the New Testament. Next of all, know that you're doing far more than you probably ever will know. And I'm sure that's the case with this little maid. And somebody had taught her well enough, even this little maid, and I don't know just exactly what age that made her. She's old enough to serve her, her mistress, but she's a captive. And she said, back there in my country, there's somebody that can help. So they think, as people do who are pagans and do not believe in the God of Israel, and he gets his old, truly an entourage of people. And even the king of Syria wrote to the king of Israel. It scared him to death. He thought he was just trying to find a way to make war with them. Because who can cure leprosy? But anyway, it, make a long story a little shorter. It makes it then to the prophet who is Elisha. It is interesting that Naaman didn't lose any time once he found out it was there. He took off, headed there. 
But now, Elisha, not being a pagan, didn't engage in some sort of mystical hocus pocus or to make some sort of demonstration and come out and jingle bells and whatever else to make it do like the pagans did in their worship. God's remedy was quite simple. Go wash in Jordan seven times. That's not difficult to understand. But Naaman, like a lot of folks, well, he has his mind all made up the way things work around where he came from, and he has no knowledge of the God of the Bible or the law of Moses, has no knowledge at all, and he's offended because he didn't make a three-ring circus out of his healing. But he had some advisors who had more common sense than he did, and they reasoned with him. said, well, if he hadn't told you to do some great thing, wouldn't you have done it? Yeah, well, then why don't you do what he said, when it, even though it seems a little thing in your eyes? And I always remember, behold, I thought. That gets more people in trouble. And that's what Naaman said when he heard the directive of the prophet. And the prophet Elisha did not even come out to see him. He sent Gehazi, his servant, out to speak the will of God concerning the curing of his leprosy. Now watch, if the prophet had bid thee do some great thing, Wouldst thou not have done it? How much rather then, when he saith to thee, wash and be clean. Well, at least he was a reasonable person. Some people, first mistake you make with them is try to reason with them. And he was an angry person to say the best of it when he first heard this because he had his expectations and that's just not the way it worked. There's a whole host of folks that will never obey the gospel of Christ or once they obey because they're weak in faith, something goes wrong from their perspective and they leave. And that's what was about to happen to Naaman. So Naaman went down he dipped himself according to the word of God through the prophet seven times in the Jordan. And the scripture says this. When he came up that seventh time and his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child, he was clean. There was no power in the water, but God used the water. Dipped seven times. Seven's always been a number of completeness. Well, who really cleansed his, his leprosy? Well, God did. There was no power in the muddy Jordan River. Even Nam realized the rivers out of his mountainous country are far cleaner and prettier than the more Jordan River. Jordan River's a drain. It, it, there's only certain parts of it kind of look pretty, and that's up where it comes out of the Sea of Galilee. But from the human point of view, Naaman's reasoning was, was flawless. Listen, are not the rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? Probably so. There was nothing magical nor curative about the waters of Jordan. I want to emphasize again, but it was not the waters of Jordan alone, not the waters of Jordan that cleansed him. God did on the basis of his faith and obedient faith in God's word. And that's the point. The Jordan didn't cure other lepers, Luke chapter 4, 27. But this was specifically to Naaman, to his situation. It cured Naaman. How? God willed it to be so. But notice God's part in the matter was not worked until man demonstrated true faith in God and his word, so it would. Now, there are many like Naaman today. When they read plain language, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, Mark 16, 16, they react just exactly like Naaman did. Why, it's it some other way just as well. Water doesn't save. Well, of course water doesn't save. Nobody ever taught that it did. That is, it taught the truth. God, through Jesus Christ, saved me from my sins. Anybody saved from sin today was saved by God through Jesus Christ via his belief and obedience of the gospel. Remember Romans 1.16? The gospel is God's power to save. Remember what we read in 1 Corinthians 15 a little while ago? But when God said, dip seven times in Jordan to Naaman, he said exactly what he meant, and he meant what he said. 
And Naaman had to have the trust, the confidence, and faith in God and his word through the prophet that it would work. And he would not be cured without it. Couldn't there be other ways? Well, I believe God can do this, that. He told you what he would do. Why not, as those reasoned with Naaman, why not do it? That's what he said. You had not probably understanding what the prophet said, did you? So when God says, arise, as was said to Saul of Tarsus as a believer who had repented of his sins, and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord, calling on the name there, by the way, is appealing to the authority of Christ. And as you arise or are baptized, you're appealing to the authority of Christ, who's the way, the truth, and the life, to save you from your sins. Again, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Acts 22, 16 is what I'm quoting. He meant that. And he'll not wash away our sins until we do what he says. Now, if some, and they do, count that as foolishness, as Paul said many did in his day concerning the gospel message, then they will today. Foolishness of God is stronger than men, wiser than men. What about when we go further in the Old Testament? You know, Israel of old, fleshly Israel, came out of the wilderness after 40 years of wandering. Well, what did they face in order to go enter in crossing from the east to the west, the Jordan River, into the land of Canaan? Well, they faced fortified cities. They faced armed people who were ready to resist. How are they going to be able to breach the wall and take the city? Well, they have God to fight for them. And he's already told them, I'll fight for you if you're faithful to me. So here's what he said by God to them concerning how they would take the first city, Jericho. Ye shall compass the city, all ye men of war, and go around about the city once. Thus shalt thou do six days. Then you come on down, and the seventh day ye shall compass the city seven times, and the priest shall blow with the trumpets. Then you come a little further down. All the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city shall fall down flat. Joshua 6, 3 through 6. Now, let me ask you. From a human military point of view, do you think they teach this at West Point? <laughs> well, that would be a foolish plan indeed. No more foolish could ever be devised. But such is often the case with God. You can't leave God out of this or it won't work. And we read, by faith the walls of Jericho fell down. Notice. It was after they exercised an obedient belief on the basis of what God had said, for faith comes by hearing the word of God. After they had been compassed about for seven days. Hebrews 11 and verse 30. Written in the New Testament as an example of saving faith. Well, we today in the Lord's church as Christians are to live by faith. We are to walk by faith. Romans 1.17, Romans 1, 2 Corinthians 5.7. Our daily living is to reflect the kind of faith that won the battle of Jericho. It wasn't the marching, per se, nor the shouting by itself that caused the walls to fall down flat. It was God. The tactic man could have called, we're back to our subject, foolish, worked because it was from God. And there are problems that arise in our lives daily. Do we trust in ourselves and not lean upon the understanding of God revealed in his word to solve those problems? We're taught Matthew 28, 20, and then later in Hebrews 13 and verse 5, Jesus said, Lo, I'm with you always. I will not forsake thee. 
Well, when we have all this going before there in the Old Testament, God said this. Did he keep his word? Yes. God has said what he said in the New Testament. Will he keep his word? Yes. So with the presence and strength of God, we should be able to say, and Paul did by inspiration of the Holy Spirit to the church in Philippi, I can do all things through Jesus Christ that strengthens me, Philippians 4.13. Jericho's in our path will never fall when we rely upon our own wisdom. I don't think so, independent of God's word. When we try to face things of our own strength. But when we depend on God and His will revealed in the gospel of Christ and the New Testament in our own lives, our daily conduct, then Paul would say this in Romans 8. We are more than conquerors through Him that loved us. So God's strictness we can go on with many others. It's foolish to some. Will God really punish those who make a little mistake? Notice usually the person thinking is looking at whatever that mistake is and saying it's a little mistake. If it is a sin, it's not a little mistake. Just partaking of a fruit God said don't eat of is not much from a human perspective. I don't think anybody who believes the Bible be the Word of God would say, Eve made a little mistake. Cain brought a sacrifice to God. Well, he sacrificed. He built an altar. He worshiped God. Was that sufficient? It was accepted according to Genesis 4. Was God too strict? The sons of Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, Offered strange fire which God had not commanded, Leviticus 10. What's the difference? Fire is fire. God had told them where to get that fire, what to do. And it was no little mistake. God killed them for it. Am I to sit in judgment and say, he's too strict? I see people around me all day long every day and have all my life, and you have too that want to look at God as a man. And by that I mean, try to say, well, he'll look at it and he'll excuse things like we do. Well, God has said that no one was touched the Ark of the Covenant, but when it was about to fall, Uzzah reached out his hand and prevented it from falling. Are you sure he was an honest individual? Nothing in the Bible says he was some sort of person who says, well, the first chance I get, I'm going to disobey God. But he died, 2 Samuel 6, 6 and 7, because he wasn't the one to touch the ark. God had made provision for the transportation of the ark and who was to carry it. And they weren't doing it. God smote him there for his error, the scripture says. And there he died by the ark of God. You know, you can be pretty close to the ark of God. You can be one of God's chosen people. You consider it a great privilege and obligation to be able to go right along with that ark. But when you violate the law of Moses in that day and time, and our day and time, when you violate the will of heaven and think you can get by with it, you can die right beside the New Testament because it didn't do you any good. It must be internalized. It must be believed. It must be put to practice. We don't have the right to sit in judgment of God. I'd say that's one of the problems of our age and in general of all mankind at any age. Our purpose is to fear God, keep His commandments, Ecclesiastes 12, 13. And Jesus is still asking everybody in will to the time He comes back, Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say, Luke 6, 46. It's also still true that Christ is the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him, Hebrews 5, 9. Why say you don't have to obey to be saved when the scripture says he's the author of eternal salvation to all them that obey him? Well, I don't obey him, but I believe in him. You don't have salvation. You're deceiving yourself. 
you're believing a lie. We must have such a faith that leads us to obey God's will. When King Saul was told to destroy all the Amalekites because of their opposition to God and his people, 1 Samuel 15, 1 through 3. Don't you think his mission was clear? It's kill everyone, including the animals. But, but he didn't, did he? He spared the king of the Amalekites, Agag, and he brought back the best of the animals. And his reasoning was, well, I'm going to sacrifice them to the Lord so it's all right. You know, some people say, well, I'm doing this, 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 and the other that's right with God, so that excuses me from not doing this, which I know the Bible says I'll do also. Well, remember Saul when you start thinking that way. It didn't work for him. That was written before time for our learning. What does that say about our approach to the truth of God putting obligations on us? You think we can get by with it in the middle of Saul? Maybe our face like Saul rather than like David. And thus the prophet Samuel would say, Behold, to obey is better than to sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. Now listen, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry, 1 Samuel 15, 22 and 23. Well, it wasn't just a little mistake, was it, that condemned King Saul. It was a disposition of heart, an attitude, a mindset that led him to that mistake and caused his ultimate destruction. Now, what of today? Now, well, the answer is found in the Hebrews epistle, Hebrews 2, chapter, uh, verses 2 through 3. For the word of God spoken by angels was steadfast, and every, not some or most, every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward. Now he applies it to us in the church. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? And the answer comes back, I won't. And no man will. God demanded loyalty, faithful obedience. And he demands it today. He's the author of eternal salvation to all them that obey him. To people nearly 2,000 years ago, the word of the cross was foolishness. To people not willing to put their trust in the word of the Lord, prove the Bible's from God and not from man. It is given by inspiration of God, 2 Timothy 3.16. Then it's all foolishness. And the gospel's foolishness. And men remain lost. The one body, the Lord's church, the family of God, the kingdom of God, the one faith, the one baptism, that's foolishness to them. No matter how plainly it's set out on the pages of the Bible. But only to those, as I say, who don't accept the revelation of God. So we need the faith and we need the love of God and the courage to accept what God has said. We then need the stubborn determination to live by it, regardless of where that may lead us, because ultimately and finally it will lead us to heaven. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter ye into the joys of thy Lord. Jesus will say to the saved on his right hand on the day of judgment. For only then are we truly walking by faith in the wisdom of God. But we'll close with this. 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 18. If any man among you seems to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. And then he would say in 1 Corinthians 4.10 that we are fools for Christ's sake. What does he mean? We accept the revelation of God. It's God's will. It tells us about salvation. It lets us know the gospel is God's power to save us, that Jesus is the Christ, and that we should follow it. Though the world who will not receive revelation considers it to be foolishness. So let us all be fools of God because we receive the truth. Jesus said, if you continue in my word, then you're my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, 
and the tr truth shall set you free. John 8, 31 and 32. Father, he prayed, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. John 17, 17. And Paul said, preach the word. Be in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. For after their own lust shall the heap of themselves teachers having itching ears, and shall be turned away from the truth unto fables. To become a Christian, the Bible's clear. You must believe on the basis of the evidence contained in the good word of God, which is the seed of the kingdom, Luke 8, 11. And you receive it, and on the basis of it, you believe it. And that word teaches that a believer must repent of sins, Acts 17, 30. Must confess one's faith in Christ, Romans 10 and verse 10. Complete his obedience to the gospel by being immersed in water by the authority of Christ. Into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's a saved relationship by the authority of Christ. For the remission or the forgiveness of sins. That's God's plan. More than that, he does not enjoin upon you. Less than that, you cannot do and become a Christian. That is the straight and narrow way in the plan of salvation. And there is no other way. And I say with Jesus, as I say to myself, why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? If as a child of God you've fallen away, you've got back into some sin, repent of it, resolve to leave it alone, turn away from it, and to follow the truth that some people call foolishness. If you're subject to the call of Christ, we invite you to come while we stand, while we sing.